Welcome back to Call Me By Your Game, the podcast where I, your host, Connor McKay, bring on a guest to hear from them about a meaningful or memorable video game from a particular moment in their life. And on this podcast, you might know that we talk to our guest as much about what made playing that game memorable and special as we will try to get into the context of how and when they had this memorable time with it. A little bit of housekeeping up top is that anything that my guest or I plug on the show today, you'll be able to find in a link in the show notes. So whether one of us brings up an awesome uh, podcast or some cartoons we want you to find, if you just scroll down to wherever you're listening, whether it's watching on YouTube or an Apple Podcasts or wherever, uh, in the episode description, there's going to be links there for you, including uh, like our social media for Call Me By Your Game. We're on you know Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Blue Sky, uh, or, or our YouTube channel, or even uh, the Patreon that we uh, contribute bonus podcasts to every month. There's going to be a link in the show notes for you to follow us there. That'll do it for the housekeeping, and I'll finally introduce our guest for today's episode. Please welcome comedian and cartoonist Rachel Van Ness. Wow! Hi. Whoa. I never know how to come on. <laughs> no, a, lo- a lot of people do get confused in that moment. You're not alone. Um, but it, what you did there, it kind of seemed like y- you, to me, were embodying the crowd's reaction when they're going to hear your vo- your name. Like a wow. Yeah, like, yeah. Not even gave applause, an applause, just a wow. Woo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the kind of reception I'm expecting or hoping for. Cool. I think that's fair. I think you'll probably meet your expectation. Uh, the, or the crowd will. Uh, Rach, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Um, you are someone uh, that I know through the Los Angeles improv community, like the majority of the guests on this podcast. Uh, and I can like kind of specifically, I wish I, I think I told you about this before the podcast. I try to pinpoint when I met my guess if I can and you can always tell when I really don't remember because I kind of skirt around it I I'm I think I kind of remember specifically meeting you because uh and I've honestly probably talked about this on Garrett's episode uh I'll try not to bring him up anymore uh but I remember when you first started playing um you know doing improv shows at the clubhouse uh it must have I think it was like 2017 and I remember talking to you know, whether the three of you were there or not, you, Garrett, and Patrick, I, I feel like I remember talking to the three of you in, like, the clubhouse lobby, and I want to say it was, like, 2017. Is this feeling even, like, kind of accurate at this point? I buy it, because at that point in time, a show called Mock uh, had labeled us, I think, as, like, the bed bugs because <gasps> we were all from Portland, and so we were always sticking together. Um, so, yeah, we, we got labeled bed bugs, which was very sweet. Did this also happen, like, w- was it possible that the reason you also got nicknamed that was because soon after you all came was when the clubhouse had a bout of bed bugs? Or am I mis- or, or were people I didn't doing know a the bit? clubhouse. I didn't know the clubhouse got a bout of bed bugs, but if that was true and they said we were responsible, <laughs> honestly incredible. <laughs> I, like, I genuinely can't say... For sure, and now it makes me. I I I kind of want to text like Jessica Svensgard because I feel like she's like the mock historian at this point. Um, yeah, but yep. I'd, I'd say that's possible. I forgot about the nickname, but I remember when the three of you showed up because you were all so not just wonderful improvisers, but really friendly. And then you and I came to find out. I think it was through was it through Instagram or like Facebook like mutuals that we were both from Modesto, California. I think we played, honestly, the Modesto game of, like, I talk about Modesto a lot yes. because I feel like it's such a um, kind of iconically terrible place. Yeah. Um, and my dad's an almond farmer, which always comes up often. Yes. But I think we played, like, the Modesto game of, like, who do we know? Yes. And it turns out you went to middle school with Ben Meshes, who I dated for four years between yes. high school and college, which is incredible. Yes. Yeah, I I remember like I think Ben was a year below me in school and in I think it was eighth grade. We were both on like yearbook at La Loma Junior High. Can you remind me where did you go to middle school or junior high? I went to Shiloh Elementary, which is like a hundred kids K through eighth, like out in the country. I would not be surprised if you had not heard of it. 
It's, I definitely know the name. It, I'm imagining something similar, but like a smaller Heart Ransom. Do you know Heart Ransom? Yeah, yeah. Heart Ransom is very close to Shiloh, and Heart Ransom was always like, oh, that's like the big school where all the like, <laughs> rich kids in the country go. Um, yes. So if that was a small school to you and that was the big school to me, then that just shows you how far apart we were. Yes, and just the breadth of, of Modesto's uh, experiences that you could have there, depending on mm-hmm. where, you know what school you go to. Uh, that's so funny. But yeah, I remember... We found all these connections, including that, like, the dueling almond farmer dads that we both have, Mm -hmm. um, which I'll still forget and be reminded of. Did you know I this doesn't have anything to do with you and I. Did you know that Amanda's family is in the pecan business? That is incredible. I didn't know that. So you guys are a union of the nuts? We are a union of the nuts, yeah. So anytime someone finds out about that, they like to pitch us like sitcom names like A Couple of Nuts or like Mixed Nuts or something like that. So uh, it's nice to know that there are a, there are a few of us, uh, I guess, n- gosh, this is about to sound gross, nut airs out there? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we're we're deep in the nut business. Yeah, <laughs> clearly you and I so in, so involved. Um, if, if yeah, I, yeah, if, really actively involved. Truly, uh, if if you can be involved in the business by getting like a couple of like gallon Ziploc bags of almonds every year, then I guess I'm pretty involved. That like, and those live in my freezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but honestly, like it's so incredible having like unfettered access to almonds because those would be so expensive and like Garrett who we weren't going to mention but he'll make (laughs) uh, almond milk for us and stuff like it's it's such a gift that I really take for granted Mm -hmm. Um, yeah it's very special but those Ziploc bags full of almonds are just like yeah so so iconic (laughs) yeah I love that or of almonds oh yes of course Um, I I was I'm so glad that you have a mutual experience of the the Ziploc bag thing. That's really that's really funny to me. Um I literally but, just got some 2 weeks ago. No way. Oh my gosh. Were you were you like visiting or did they arrive to you? I was visiting, but my dad will ship them to me sometimes. Nice. Um it's a uh, so that's like, you know, one of our many many connections and throughout the years, you know, we've we've got of course got this like a uh, very funny Modesto connection. You made a good point of yeah, saying how like distant we were. I'm pretty uh, like we didn't know each other existed till we were out here. But then you know, after meeting and getting to know you all, you are someone who like I've gotten to hang out with a little bit over the years that I don't see as much anymore. But f- because of our because of improv, we've continued to like circle each other um, and just kind of be around. So. That's like, you know, kind of how we know each other. But what do you want? A, if I'm missing anything, feel free to bring it up. But what do you want to share with yourself about the listener outside of like our mutual connections? Um, that, okay. Like relative to video games. I know you said generally, but I I guess there's like. Well, outside of generally. Because you're like, you're an amazing, truly one of the funniest and smartest improvisers I've ever seen. Um, an wow. amazing cartoonist, which I know I introduced you. I love your cartoons. Um, but like, thank you. I, yeah, I, I was sort of thinking outside of games. If there's anything else you want the listener to know about yourself, but I've I've kind of shared a lot. But you can share as much or as little know, as you'd you like. You nailed me. Um, I think as as best as I possibly could. I mean, I'll I'll plug my art later. But yeah. Yeah, I don't. I'm so sorry. I just generally <laughs> don't have anything huge about me that I think people really need to know. Um, that's okay. Yeah. No, that's like the. It's the conundrum of asking people to talk about themselves on a podcast. It is. This is about the reaction half the time where people are like, "I don't know. What do you want me to say?" So you're all good, um, Rachel. We are going to get into your history in general about video games in just a second, but will you please uh, tell us what you brought on for the main event later and call me by your game? Okay. My game is Mario Party 2. Yay. I'm hearing uh, now 
the little like when you're doing your character select in that game because I've I have a lot of experience with this one and you finally choose everything and Toad will have those reactions like whoa like those little things. <laughs> I heard that yeah. after you said Mario Party too. Incredible! You heard it right then. Good, good, good. Uh, just like the crowd uh, letting out a wow when you got introduced. Um, I'm so pumped to hear about you know your experience with this game for the main event later, but. In general, let's get into your history with games. What are some of your like earliest memories, uh, whether it was like watching someone or playing something yourself? Yeah, so um, perhaps like most people with an older brother, I was a video game watcher or uh-huh. a perpetual second player. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, my older brother, Michael, he's a year older than me, but he is just so incredible at video games and so he was always first player because I would always die super easily or get overwhelmed but we uh started off on the Super Nintendo playing like Ooh. Kirby or I was thinking like uh Earthworm Jim oh my goodness and yeah. yeah and um what else then you got like the PlayStation and we were playing what was he playing like Twisted Metal okay and oh I loved when he was playing, like, the Final Fantasy games, so, like, Dirge of Cerebrus, and those ones I was particularly stoked to watch because I loved all of the, like, little clips. Yeah. Like the the cutscenes they would have? Exactly. And, like, Michael and I are both, like, still, like, really huge fans of anime, so Final Mm -hmm. Fantasy, I think, like, really appealed to that side of us. And um, on those games, I would be more of his like little assistant where he'd be like, what move do you think I should do? And I was like, oh, "Oh, you're asking me? Maybe this one. Um, (laughs) Celeb shot. And then (laughs) celeb shot. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then he got the PS2. And that's when I got like my first game, which was Dance Dance Revolution. um, Amazing. Which I adore. And for me, like. I think I realized, like, anything that's a little more, like, kinetically based, um, I can do a lot better at, where I'm just not good at, like, like memorizing combinations of buttons and stuff. That's very overwhelming to me. Yeah. But that didn't keep me from, like, my brother also had Soul Calibur, so we would play that, and I completely just button mashed. Um, and he would actually, he would always play as Yoshimitsu, and he would just crush. Uh-huh. Um... This is. Do you and, mind if I if I like uh, pump the brakes real quick? Because I want to dive into a couple of these things with you, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm so sorry for just like no. rolling through it. Hey, you know? you're you're doing a fantastic job so far. Uh, I just I like there's details I want to know about. Well, first I wanted to mention I know I brought up um, Victoria Longwell's episode earlier. She was a Soul Caliber two. That was the game she brought on. Um, And that is truly the Soul Calibur series is so good for just like, just give someone a controller and they can just mash around. Um, Let's just fight. Let's just, let's just fight. Um, That was presented in such a, like a jolly way (laughs) of such like an (laughs) ominous activity. Um, uh, So DDR, you had mentioned that, you know, when we were discussing a possible game for you to bring on, do you remember, was that something that like, you were seeing in the arcades or at like a, oh man, this is going to make me ask you specific questions. Or were you, was it just like a console game that you played with like a mat? So I would see it at arcades, but I was always like, I realized like between the arcade and being at home, it's like two different games because Mm -hmm. when you're playing it at the arcade, you have to like step so much harder. Uh Whereas um, my parents got it for us with like two of the mats. Uh So like, very much a part of like playing on the mats was like don't step too hard don't step too hard like you're gonna ruin the sensor (laughs) so we would always like i have also have two younger siblings who would play and so they got like outlawed a couple of times for stomping too hard they lost privileges Um, they lost their privileges so we were like very (laughs) protective of the mats and huge advocates of like a light foot which made playing at the arcade like a completely opposite skill set that's a tough thing to adjust to yeah, yeah. So, you know, that was tough. But, um, yeah, so we played it at home okay. all the fucking time, constantly. Oh my and my gosh. 
best friend, um, Samantha from high school would always come over after school because her parents were like doing the commuter life with San Mm -hmm. Jose. So Michael, Samantha and I would just play every day for like four hours at a time. Wow. Just like the most fit high schoolers you've ever seen. (laughs) Yeah. And somehow Michael was still the best. (laughs) (laughs) I think because even in DDR, you're doing some level of combinations. And Mm -hmm. I think he just has a really good mind for stuff like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Yeah, DDR is, you know, one of these games that uh, constantly is brought up by guests on the show that so many people have, like, uh, close connections with. It's kind of reminiscent of, like, the Guitar Hero series that it's something that I think is really accessible to, to many non gamers. Like you don't have to have kind of what you're, I think you were, you were getting into this a little bit. Um, you don't have to have like a, an extreme gaming vocabulary like Michael or myself to enjoy rhythm games. I love rhythm games. Um, have, did you know that, um, mutual friend and, and former guest, Nicole Loria growing up, her parents got her like the, like, I don't know if they were official, but like the actual in arcade pads. That is insane. And I believe it. But yes. it's funny you mentioned Nicole because I've actually played DDR at her house. I no brought. Way. So, yeah, over pandemic, Jeremy Schmidt, friend of the show, uh, we were living together and Jeremy found a PS2 on the side of the road <laughs> that like still worked. So he gave it to me and in pandemic, I was like having a really hard time connecting with like joy with improv being down. And I realized I didn't have any hobbies. So I bought two dance mats and dance dance revolution again and started playing. And it was awesome. Like, oh my gosh. It brought all of the childhood nostalgia back. It was so fun. I love hearing that. That's so, man, so many people, I think during that time, probably experienced something quite similar to you uh and like we so many of us sought out like i don't not relics of the past necessarily but just like activities things that brought us joy before so that's so fun to hear and i've i have heard tales of this uh sidewalk ps2 so i'm glad to hear that jeremy's not a liar yeah he's not a liar he's a he's a scrappy santa claus yes <laughs> <laughs> um that's amazing thank you for uh, letting me ask you just a little more about DDR. Um, I this is this is about me and unrelated, but I, I recently went to an arcade bar in Burbank called Round One. It's this huge. Mm-hmm. Have you been there before? Yeah, yeah. Garrett had a Christmas party there last year. Okay, nice. They've got like D. I don't think I don't know if it's exactly DDR, but DDR esque machines there. Uh, I think they do because Garrett was like. Are we going to talk to my coworkers? And I was like, no, I have a cup of coins and I'm going to play DDR this whole time. <laughs> have fun, um, babe. <laughs> yeah, have fun. But it was actually fun because, like, uh, Garrett and I went to Japan two years ago and they have, like, whole malls, essentially, of arcade games. Mm. And once Garrett and I went and we saw there was, like, DDR set up, two mats, like, together. And we saw this salary man who is, like had just come from work and he was playing DDR. He was playing both mats at the same time and he was just gliding and flying. He looked so light. He was doing twirls. He was doing like also the most possible, impossible, like expert level DDR. I think he was in his socks and he was just like crushing it and he looked so happy and so free. And it was one of my favorite memories from that trip. That is absolutely incredible. I feel like I, you just telling me this, I'm like extrapolating a whole story about this man in my head. Like whether this is like not the only thing he has, but like a true joy in his life, like coming from work maybe. Uh, That's an amazing story, dude. Yeah, I was like, oh, he still has play. Like he's an adult, but he still makes time to like do the stuff that clearly like just brings, like you could see the little kid dancing, you know? Absolutely. That's like- that's like a Nintendo commercial waiting to happen or something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they should go find this guy. He's great. Yeah, truly. Um, so I, I know I took us down that tangent for a while. We sort of left off and we don't have to go over every detail of your life, but if you what truly, but if you want to share a ton of detail, 
green light. Um, so after DDR and the, you know, which with you said was like the first game you ever got, was gaming still one of those things that you would watch uh, in the next few years? Like Michael play? Where did it go for you from this time? Um, yeah, I, I like I watched Michael for a pretty long time. Uh, like until I left for, I probably wasn't watching him in high school as much, but still occasionally, especially if he was playing a Final Fantasy game for those cool. cut cut scenes or like Kingdom Heart. I yes. love the cut scenes in that. Um, but there's also like I always like low barrier to entry games, and I like the games when they feel more social or like anybody can play. So my sister also got Sing Star. Um, which is essentially like a karaoke game. Mm-hmm. Um, but one New Year's, like my whole family played Sing Star, and it's like one of my like best memories of all time. <laughs> like my dad and uncle are like plastered singing Sweet Home Alabama, <laughs> <laughs> like so terribly, or like my grandma was like humming over everyone, no matter what song they did. Like she just <laughs> had to be involved in a way that was like. She's a narcissist, so it was like, of course she has to intervene. Yes. Um, but it was just like one of the best the best nights when it's like, it felt so special when it was like, oh, the adults are playing too. This yes. is the best thing ever. Like, we're all playing together. And that felt so rare and so magical about that night. Yeah, that's that's so, that's really sweet. I, I feel like this is kind of in a similar thing that we were talking about when it came to rhythm games. Um, but... I also really treasure those moments because they're few and far between for me as well. I think my sort of like happiest when it comes to gaming as much as I love I'm such a solo player is having a Mm -hmm. group of people over and sort of setting it up and letting people play while I just sort of like have a snack and watch. Um, But I like have some specific memories too of like first getting the Wii and having like my grandparents want to play like... So yeah. it's kind of your, your sing star memory is just bringing me back there a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's like, I think that's the best because I feel like even in my adult life and maybe why I do improv is like I'm always chasing that like manic sleepover energy where you're just like giggling and you don't really know why anymore. <laughs> and I think sometimes my favorite games have like manufactured that i've had that even in pandemic with jackbox yes. you know um and like it's a little different but garrett and i also played overcooked in the pandemic yeah. and i loved that um i love anything that kind of prompts that like manic stress giggling <laughs> absolutely that's gosh that's so relatable it's it's like um i don't know it's like a ball of energy when that happens that's like uh excitingly it's it's exciting in like not a dangerous way but you're like what's gonna happen i don't know if i can control my laughter or whatever so i love hearing that um for you i would like to know um in the last few years and, and maybe some of the games you just mentioned fall into this category what have been ways you've connected with games whether it be other communal experiences or maybe something we haven't talked about Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's mostly been just like DDR on my own when I feel cooped up um, or overcooked, which has been so, so fun. Yes. Um, Because playing it with Garrett is such a joy because we've (laughs) I've heard a lot of couples talk about it as being like a good way of assessing like how your communication is. Uh And Garrett and I have worked professionally on projects before like I feel like for us it's like a good reminder that like we are good at communication and we do thrive and we like take turns deciding who's in charge and oh cool I think we're also like both really into cooking and Uh we love like the bears so I think in a small way it feels like getting to cosplay (laughs) like restaurant which we love but I also played overcooked with my um my little brother and his girlfriend recently and that was still just like so fun oh i love that i like this is a game that i feel like especially since the pandemic i've heard so much about and i finally got to play it myself recently and you talking about like the restaurant of it all and the bear of it all which i I feel like that probably comes up with so many people who play it now it's hard not to just like shout phrases from that show or 
or whatnot. And but I'm glad to hear that you all have like such a good time with it. Have you played a one yeah. and two or or just one of the other? Uh, boy, I'm not even sure which one I've played. Um, it's all probably good. Probably one. Cool. Well, there's I a second one out one? there if you happen to have not played it. I know our like our computer which we are running the game through died oh. or is broken. <laughs> it's been broken for like a couple of years. <laughs> so um, that's kind of gotten in the way of us playing it. But I miss it because I do just like again like that manic like I'm going to fall on my face yes. like shit 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 there are so many tickets we're so fucked or like uh-huh. I felt it I dropped the pot in the lava we're so <laughs> screwed like I love that kind of like mutual like just sense of being overwhelmed and it's still just being like the best the best possible time yes that's great that's so fun that like I think some experiences like that can stress some people out so I'm really happy to hear and it's not that you you It's not that you couldn't have maybe felt stress or maybe that's part of the enjoyment, but I'm glad to hear that you find joy in that like overwhelming game, I guess. I think there's like the good kind of stress, which is like stress at a game. And I often find like I tend to struggle to take like risks, like even in board games, I'll play like very conservatively Mm -hmm. and I feel like games like Overcooked like force me to get in over my head. And I think for me, like in a weird way, it's like therapy of learning that like that's fun and okay. Yes. Um, If that makes any sense at all. It absolutely does because I think I can relate to you a lot in the way that I'll play games like that and operate. And I'll see other people who, you know, don't who know how to play these some of these style of games and take risks and gamble and it pays off like. Uh, there's so many examples I could give, but I, all that to say is I totally relate to that. Yeah. And I think it's like, again, like the joy of failure, like even thinking of like having to do like a DDR song on like expert that mm-hmm. you're not ready for. And you just watch somebody try so hard and eat complete <laughs> shit anyway. And they're like exhausted. It's like, I feel like my family lives for like roasting those moments. So I think it's <laughs> also just like, you're just trying to find opportunities for failure so we all can laugh and have a good time, if that yes, makes sense. It absolutely does. Um, there's, uh, yeah, it makes me think of a story that I'll, maybe I'll tell you off mic about uh, just times where people have, it's gone the other way of like, this should be fun for this reason, but then someone gets actually upset. <laughs> Um, oh no. Like, look, it happens. <laughs> we all are emotional at different times, but uh, I'll tell you that. I'll just share that anecdote off mic. Um, one other thing, I, I have two more questions for you, Rach. Um, the first yeah. of which is you just mentioned before the Overcooked discussion that um, you'll you'll play – were you saying that you'll play DDR to this day like you might occasionally get it out or – okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Nice. What, like, <laughs> Did you want me to – yeah. <laughs> it's crazy coming back to it as an adult because yeah. I realized like um, the first day I played it, like extensively, I noticed like the sides of my legs hurt. Like oh. my, it's like kind of good for working your stabilizing muscles. And I was like, oh, I guess between middle school and now, maybe I lost some yeah. of this like <laughs> muscles. <laughs> uh-huh. Also, like I guess gen genuinely a good workout um, yeah. for mobility in a weird way. Um, so that's also appealing to me about it. But I just lo- like. Again, as an anime girl, like the songs and those mm-hmm. beats like really hit for me. Like I always loved Butterfly and Speed Over Beethoven. Like those are my favorite songs to play on it. So, yes. yeah. Oh, that's so much yeah, fun. It, um, it just hits. Yes. I, I Bonus question that I want to ask you. It's like I'm giving myself permission to ask, to you know, the job I've told you I'm going to do today. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to is- deny you any of these questions. Just a heads up. <laughs> Oh, okay, huge relief for me. Uh, this is very Modesto specific. I, I was getting here earlier and I, I sort of forgot to ask, but what were the places that you would go? Like, where were the arcades? Were you going to like uh, Funworks? Were you going to like someplace in the mall? Like where, do you remember where? I don't think I was really going to arcades because the only option, there weren't that many options. Okay, like, you, that's right. You had said you were mostly playing The thing that comes to mind is like, yeah, Sorry yeah. About that. Like 
how dare you? I know. Um, Misery. <laughs> no, I think there weren't that many places to play. And my parents like weren't down to like give us money to really spend on games. Although um, my grandparents had a cabin up in Long Barn in the Sierras and there is a uh, like a ski rink there and they had a couple of arcade games. So Michael and I would always play Pac-Man and Space Invader. Oh, so that those are also fond memories. But again, it's like it's funny because video games genuinely stress me out. <laughs> like like Pac-Man a little bit. I'm like, I don't like that those ghosts are chasing me. It's <laughs> so stressful. Or like that, like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck feeling. Yes. But at the same time, I think that it's like weird that I'm saying that I also love it. So it's a very contradictory relationship with stress that's like manifested in video games for me. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like there's ebbs and flows to it. And then and like could that could be happening all the time. But especially as like, you know, you've gotten older and learned how to maybe deal with it. Maybe your relationship has just changed with it slightly. Yeah, I try to be less precious, but like, that's why, I mean, two thoughts uh, in the, actually just one thought, but that's why in the <laughs> Fallout show, which I watched and yeah. loved, because I would also watch Michael play Fallout, because I love, anytime like the lore of the world is really strong, mm-hmm. I'm watching it. Yeah. Um, But that's why like a moment in the show that's so fucking funny is when the knight is running from the like mutant bear and the knight's running and going like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. And it was like, (laughs) that was just such a moment where it's like, yeah, that's what the game is like, you know, 100 percent. I'm like in the last year and a half for the first time ever touched a Fallout game. And like, it's not a series I've spent time with. And I having had like maybe 20 hours experienced total really love this series for similar reasons i felt like this has been said but they took like a world that was so interesting and that had such rich lore like you're saying and just told a great original story with it uh y- you know I- i'm so pumped to see where they go with it um but uh one last question i have for you before we maybe mm-hmm. head into our break um is has there been a game recently or an experience that you've seen that you're like, ooh, I want to try that. I've never done it, but that feels interesting to me. That is a very good question. Um, Everybody keeps trying to pitch me on, like, Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing. Oh, yeah. But I think, like, in having this conversation, I'm almost reflecting that, like, I don't think it hits on the things about video games that I really enjoy. Yeah. Because that's more about, like, resource collecting, mm-hmm. um, which is funny because in my life, I'm very much that way of, like, <laughs> I like to move up levels and, um, you know, if you do this, you get this. But I think in video games, I do like that kind. It's the same thing as, like, a horror movie, like, mm-hmm. being nervous and scared and so it almost makes me think i should play a game like what's it called like amnesia or something like one of the more spooky games yeah Um, like maybe a resident evil would be fun for you if you know what that is yeah yeah i mean that could be fun but something where there are sort of like jump scares and you're running around but i think for me like playing that alone probably wouldn't be as exciting as like I think for me, like video games are communal. And so I'm not sure how much joy I would get from playing it on my own, but playing it with somebody in the room, like us switching and like one of us being a watcher and one of us playing, but both of us being like, oh my God, I'm so fucking scared. I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I think that would be really fun for me. Okay. That's so, I feel like you've done such a good job of like assessing the information that you've even brought forward today and sort of like having like a really good educated guess on what you would enjoy. Um, But that being the case, I I told you later in the show, I'll have some game recommendations for you, but I've got a Mm -hmm. bonus one for you. I think one that might hit perfectly on like the Venn diagram that you just kind of laid out for me is this game called uh, Dead by Daylight, where you, it's a multiplayer game. You can play with friends Mm -hmm. or you can play with people online where You're like a group of four people essentially in a like a slasher movie and each the the, uh, I guess the goal of every game is to escape like your like confinement or wherever you're being held before like the uh, the monster gets to you and someone else is controlling the monster and 
this game also has like worked with a bunch of different i want to say a bunch of different like horror properties to where you can play as specific horror characters um and so it that one might be something that you find fun that sounds really fun it reminds me of um like the mechanics of it i wonder if they're similar to like the board game what's it called like space cadet or something or like Mm. captain sonar if you've played those they're like more of those like teamwork based games where it's like you're working on this puzzle and you're doing this job and you're doing this job and you all have to work to like get out it sounds like similar it's basically escape room video game right with threat of of slasher it sounds like it exactly that that sounds fun it could be perfect um well Rachel, thank you for walking me through, you know, your general history with games. This was really fun. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll get into all things Mario Party 2. So I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to Call Me By Your Game. Uh, Connor McCabe here for the second half of today's episode with, of course, our guest today, Rachel Van Ness. Rachel, welcome back. Thank you so much. We are going to, of course, finally get into our main event today to discuss Mario Party 2. You know, all opinions are valid, but it's my personal favorite Mario Party, so I'm extra excited to talk about this today. Um, Rach, like I said, I'm going to get into a little table setting of like some, just some like details and context of this game before we talk about your history. But if you have like, uh, any tidbits or facts about the game you want to include, uh, jump in at any time. Okay. I'm curious if you hit like the one fact that I've observed about it. Ooh, okay. I'll wait and see if you hit it. All right. This will be, this this is my test. I love it. So... Without Mm -hmm. further ado, I'll jump right into it. Mario Party 2 is a 1999 party video game developed by Hudson Soft and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo 64. The second game in the Mario Party series, it was released in Japan in December 1999 and worldwide in 2000. The game received mostly positive reviews. Uh, It was praised for the improvements it made to the original, the multiplayer and mini games, but criticized the lack of originality. Uh, while graphics received a better but otherwise mixed response. Uh, This game features six playable characters, which are the exact same ones that you can play in the first game. Mario, Luigi, Princess Peach, Yoshi, Wario, and Donkey Kong, uh, who can be directed as characters on various themed game boards. The player moves around the board with the goal of finishing the game with the most stars, which can be earned in a handful of ways. Um... This game was followed by Mario Party 3 the next year uh, and was later re-released on the Wii Virtual Console in 2010. It's actually, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Virtual Console. It was like the first sort of, sort of, sort of first Nintendo online store where you could buy stuff and download them to your console. This was on the Wii. Mm -hmm. And this is the only one, only one of these first three N64 Mario Parties that you could buy specifically because in one and three they had a lot of mini games which required you you might remember this because i think you said you played the first where you would rotate the control stick and this, this... was what i was gonna talk about yeah. oh really yeah so did you okay so why don't you jump into what you were gonna share since we kind of got there well just the thing that i loved about the first one was the rotating the joystick <laughs> i would my we would I mean I can talk about this later but me and my friends and my brother would go absolutely ham at doing this and all of our my favorite games were like having to get the bag out of the ocean or whatever where you're like rolling it as fast as you can but I heard it just like totally messed up all of the controllers so they got rid of it and we got huge blisters on our palms from going so hard so yeah so you personally experienced the great blister catastrophe Yeah, but it was awesome. I was so sad to see it go. And I recently played Mario Party 1 um, with my my siblings. And trying to play those joystick games without doing the palm strategy is impossible. Oh, yeah. Completely impossible. Like, 
I know, of course, like theoretically, you could use your thumb, but you don't, you're not going to do anything with that. You've got, you talked about the palm method. And then I have seen people sort of grab it with like an index finger and a thumb and try to twist it around. And I don't think that works any better. It's so hard. It's yeah. impossible. Like I could not get a chest off the ground. There is no way. Yes. The, um, this is an, yeah, I'm just giving, Rachel, you're getting it all today. You got an additional recommendation. You're getting a, an additional fun fact here too, um, Ooh. which after, th- I've, I've shared this on the show before, or maybe it was a different podcast, but the original Mario Party was actually, I want to say, I should have just had this prepared, even though we were talking about Mario Party 2, but the reason that those games weren't included in part two is because I guess the the like the state of New York or someone got like had so many complaints lodged about the game from like parents about like the blisters being created with kids that I think you could there was some sort of voucher program where if you had this game you could like basically Nintendo would they made this glove that people could then put on so that they wouldn't get blisters and there are a few of them out there still. That is fucking sick. You yes. could have had your little Michael Jackson glove <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> to play Mario Party. Truly. Um, like, forgive me, like, I'm sure there's there's way there's many accounts of this story and this factoid which people can look up on YouTube. I don't I don't have it in front of me, so forgive me. The details are funky. Um uh, but to finish out this context, there's not much more to share, is that um this was a uh, yeah. It was released for the Wii Virtual Console in 2010. The Wii U Virtual Console in 2016 is now a part of the Nintendo Switch Online Plus expansion pack. Got brought in 2022. Um, so you can, if you have a Nintendo Switch in a certain tier of online package, you can play it. Um, and this game uh, content from this game was remastered as part of uh, the Mario Party the Top 100 for the Nintendo 3DS Mario Party Superstars, which is on the Switch, and uh, the upcoming Super Mario Party Jamboree for the Switch as well. So, like, this game, I'm going to get into this as well later, established a lot of norms for the series, but also has some, like, favorite boards and mini games that were established that continue to get brought forward in the Mario Party series to this day. So, outside of, like, my personal love for this game, and it, which is mostly fueled by nostalgia, I'm glad to see, like, the actual good elements of it have, like, carried forward. Um, Rachel, did you want to like underline anything or include any additional like facts before we move on to your history? Um, not really. Just like a thing I really appreciated about Mario Party 2 that Mario Party 1 didn't have was on Mario Party 1, the, the boards were very straightforward. Mm-hmm. And I think in Mario Party 2, they introduced like more of an element of like chance and risk. Like at any time your stars could get swapped with somebody yes. else. <sighs> Or, like, the game could just completely turn around in a move. And to me, that made it so much more exciting to play. Mm -hmm. But I like that they didn't go overboard with, like, all the items you can buy either. Because I think in the later versions, it almost became, like, too complicated. Like, there could be too much strategy involved. So I feel like Mario Party 2 was, like... The perfect amount of chance and risk without overcomplicating the game. Yeah, I feel like I mean that was some that's something I love about it too. It's a game that you can kind of play with anybody and even though there are parts of this game that I still think I'm very good at, I like the fact that anybody picking up the controller can come out as the victor based on chance or like a crazy thing or Bowser stealing all my crap. Like it's it is really fun for me and I know some people probably I would, I'm sure there's people out there who don't enjoy that and would rather it be more fair. But when I'm playing a game like Mario Party, I'm like, this is, a, I feel like it will tie to your point from earlier of just liking a communal sort of game is that it brings forward that chance, that stress and that fun, really. Um, I, I've, I've mm-hmm. said too much, uh, but I totally agree. Rachel, how did you come to play this game for the first time? Did you all have an N64 growing up? Yeah, so the N64 actually lived at my grandma's house, and she was, like, a mile down the street, and we're at her house, like, she half-raised us. We were there, like, half the time. 
So a very exciting part of going to grandma's house was that we had the N64 and we were always playing Super Smash Bros or Mario Party 2. Oh, nice. Um, And I have two, I have three siblings total. So like the perfect amount of people don't always be playing Mario Party 2 or Super Smash Bros. So it was always yes. so, so fun. Oh, that's great. I like plenty of memories growing up of like me and my best friend and then my sister playing like a four player game. But there's always like a computer that's a part of it. And this is I, I'm going to try to stop sharing about myself because I'm here to hear from you. But we would always I'm here to share in the communal experience of celebrating Mario Party. Too. <laughs> oh, I love it. What I'll share quickly is that this this will still happen today where like I'll be playing with like my one of my best friends and like Amanda and and because we've played this a few times together and we always gang up on the computer and hate the computer Mm -hmm. we'll set them at like a normal difficulty so that they're not a pushover but it always feels like the computer like favors them whether or not that's my bias um so so there's that but you were saying the four of you was like just the perfect group for this or at least yeah yeah and like I first got into Mario Party 1 because um, some kids... I was friends with Megan Dolan, and my brother was friends with Todd Dolan. Uh. So we would all do a sleepover at each other's houses, and when we were at their house, we would always play Mario Party 1. So that's like... It's rooted in that sleepover energy of like, we're eating pizza, we're staying up until 1 in the morning playing Mario Party, and that was the best ever. So then when we got Mario Party 2, it was like, you know... can continuing the party i guess yes um the party goes but on. yeah but because michael again was always the best i don't know that we were like it was less like let's gang up on computer because there was no computer and it's like let's see if any of the three of us can beat michael yes um yeah so that was like kind of more of the drive but michael was so good that like <laughs> if you fucked with him he would make it <laughs> exponentially worse for you (laughs) (laughs) that's okay don't poke the bear yeah exactly so yeah Uh, it was it was so fun oh that's great um when we're thinking about the game itself uh did you have like a go-to character or a favorite uh board in mario party 2 Mm-hmm. so here's the thing michael always got luigi so then you had to figure out who you were Everybody wants Luigi first, so he always got Luigi. So I cycled between, I think, um, now I play consistently as Peach, Mm -hmm. but I would cycle between Peach, Mario, and um, Yoshi. Cool, yeah. I feel like Mm -hmm. in the circles I've run in throughout my life, Yoshi is usually like the hot button, or like the hot character, so... That's funny. I'm so, like, it's so... I think you were saying this, but it's so funny to hear from your group's perspective that Luigi was the sought after. Yeah, Luigi was the best. I don't know why. It's just like, and Michael was always like, he he still is like a very tall, skinny guy. So I guess Luigi just like (laughs) resonated. We're like, we all want to be Luigi, which I guess was our like subconscious way of being like, we all want to be as good as Michael. (laughs) Yes, that's, oh my gosh. That's so funny to like look into. I love that. Um, Okay, great. Um, Board wise, I mean, the boards in this game like are one of the huge reasons that I love Mario Party 2. Um, do you have a personal favorite or like a couple that you want to highlight? I'm like looking through to remember what boards they had because I always loved Peach's Cake, but I think that's Mario Party 1. Gotcha. Um, oh, yeah. I okay. I did not like the space board. Western oh. was okay. I think I would usually choose the kind of more witchy board. Oh, yes. The like, uh, it's not the like spooky. Halloween, but it is scary. Yeah, it's like spooky. Yeah, I liked the spooky board the best. Yes. Uh, something, too, that like truly is a small detail that I love. It's going to be part of the factoid later is how in this game, wherever you go, you've got the characters have these cute themed outfits. Oh, the outfits are so good. They're so fun. Yes. The like the witch ones are great because you're like wizards or slash witches. The the Western one, of course, you're all like cowboys. Yeah, astronauts. Yes. Um, there's like the mis- there's like the mystery board 
and you're all kind of like uh like safari looking like not quite Indiana it's like Jones, dinner theater but... characters right yes, kind yes. Of? it's so funny yeah. um gosh I don't I don't know if I have a favorite board but like I I do have I think the ones I've played the most are like oh there's a pirate one too how could I forget mm-hmm gosh how um, could you those are so good um when you think about the game itself as well, Rachel, what are is there a thing about it that you'd like to highlight, like an element that like has like a strong memory for you? Whether it's like, oh, I like the mini games, or I like the I don't know the dice rolling. That's probably not it, but yeah, just kind of curious. Um, games I really liked were I loved. Um, <laughs> Again, like the more button mashy games of like when you're blowing up the Bowser balloon yes. or something. I also, I think my favorite game was Facelift, where you have to get the face, the most accurate to the face in the middle. Um, I don't know if that was like the little artist in me, but I just love that game. And I like Topsy Turvy a lot. Oh, yeah. But that one was like also nerve wracking because, again, I'm trying to beat Michael as best I can. <laughs> um and I also just like it was just so fun playing the two on two or the three on one because that uh-huh. had more of that element of like my actions affect other people now. <laughs> so I have to <laughs> I have to figure this out. Um, it's how you became and, such you a, know, it's how you became an empathetic person, right? Mario Party to think. <laughs> I, I guess because I'd be like, wow, if I'm on Michael's team, this is going to be great. And if I'm on Emma's team, good fucking luck beating the boys. Um <laughs> But I also love, too, like, um, the games where you could kind of um, fuck people over a little bit. So there's the one where it's, like, you're um, picking how many, like, fruits or honeycombs you want out of the tree. Yes. It's so great. And so Michael and I, because we were the oldest, we would often, like, it's usually, like, Michael's the best. But as second in line, Michael looks out for me the most. And Uh it was more about (laughs) beating up on Emma and Sam. So, like, Michael would, in that game, there are, like, certain decision-making points where you can almost decide within one or two people, like, who's going to get fucked. And so if Michael could protect me, he usually would. Wow. Like a bit of a, like an unspoken alliance sort of thing. Yeah, Michael and I always had an alliance, and Emma and Sam, I think even now that we're older, have more of an alliance. Um, That's so funny. (laughs) So, yeah, yeah. That's what happens when you have too many kids. They form alliances, and they compete against each other. Yes, I need to have some semblance of, like, power and, and, like, who is that going to come from, and it's aligning with one of my siblings. Uh, That's Whereas, like, I'm I'm, a... child of a child of two what does that mean i'm i'm one of two siblings and yeah so you can only have an alliance with yourself yeah <laughs> and so maybe that honestly like all like maybe it was why me and my sister were like more combated f- for so much of our lives growing up is because we were just teamed up against each other all the time it felt you like. didn't have anyone to exclude and that was the problem <laughs> yes 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 we needed i genuinely as a kid always wanted a third so that like there could be we could just diffuse this a little bit um but that's so funny yeah uh, you bringing up um i don't need to i'm not going to dive into every detail but the specifically the like fruit and uh like honeycomb game like I Mm -hmm. love that one so much because of the, like, quick math you kind of have to do of, like, of how many to choose to, you know, ensure that you're not going to get got versus protecting someone. Um, It's funny, too, the, like, throughout the whole game, how there are little meta games we'll sort of be playing on our own, like, like Michael looking out for you or, okay, this person really has been just getting destroyed. So I'm going to steal coins or a star from someone else sort of thing. Like the, just yeah. the wi- one thing I love about games is how people will develop like their own rules or ways that they play them. And this is like kind of in that vein. So I, I'm so glad you brought something like that up. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. It's like that quote about basketball that's like, 
the secret of basketball is that it's not about basketball. And it's like the secret of Mario Party is it's not about Mario Party. It's about the inner dynamics of the group who is playing Mario Party. And I think that's totally true because like those alliances would definitely have an effect. And it's like if Michael, I think there would be times where Michael would steal from Emma or Sam, even though I was in second place. Yeah. And so I think it's like that's where you can see those kind of like allegiances manifest or like if we ever had a friend over who we felt like wasn't up for our typical brand of like <laughs> honestly bullying, um, <laughs> we wouldn't choose to steal the star from them. Like we wanted them to enjoy their time. Oh, yeah. And so I'm also have been thinking about this a lot. And I think my tendency to kind of monitor the group around me and make sure everybody's OK. Yeah. Yeah kind of can manifest in decision making in Mario Party as if the outcome of the game would possibly impact their emotional well-being. You know what? You know, I I think that is very considerate and caring of you. Uh, but I will say that I, I think that does happen because I have encountered moments which uh, like where someone has become upset because you've stolen something from them like as adults. So it's possible. It's, it's possible. Yeah. I know. It's funny how you can get so emotionally invested in something that truly means nothing. Yeah. But I've had, I remember so many situations where somebody steals like stars from me and I'm like, how? I thought we were friends. Yes. That's so good. I, I've had like, I mean, just childhood. Let's just say I played with people that I played with as kids and to have mm-hmm. like someone's emotions as a like that they had as a kid return because of like playing a game is so interesting it's like not that we are transporting back to those dynamics or those times but it is kind of i think just showed me how it's hard to separate those feelings sometimes and it's easy especially when you like you all have played this game so much together i bet you could pick it up anytime and and you know how people are going to operate Yeah, yeah, which is funny because now it's like, yeah, it's honestly the vibe is still like, let's beat Michael. Um, (laughs) But because sometimes the vibe can be like, let's shit on Sam. It (laughs) oscillates between those (laughs) those two because Sam's the youngest and he hates losing. Now he's much better about it. But we were we were poking a bear on either side of us, I guess. Um, But I think you're right that it brings out. Like, even in adults, like, that kind of inner child, for better or for worse, but, like, those automatic emotional kind of instincts we have just so quickly manifest. And I think especially as adults, it can take you by surprise. It absolutely can. It's It can be, like, shocking. Even when I've, like, felt stuff like that, I'm not to blame, not to be like, oh, these people I play with, they're emotional. Like, I've gotten there in my life before, and that is shocking. Um I want to ask, I want to get into, we, you've done such a great job, Rachel, of like weaving in the game and the context uh, already seamlessly without me having to prompt you to get us a little more there. Will you do me a favor and can you scene paint the, like the room in your grandma's house where this was, was set up and like what it was like there? Yeah, this is such a fun exercise. So the funny thing is we would be in the living room. There's a big TV in an in a big cabinet. We're not playing on that. <laughs> That's like there are like couches and a table. We are not playing there. There is a corner of the room on the carpet where the Christmas tree usually goes. But for any other time, it's video game corner. We're playing on a small probably TV that you can put a VCR into. Yeah. Uh or like a TV with VCR. Oh, yes. Um, Like the combo. So you could put a cassette in. I had one growing. I like inherited my parents' old TV as a kid, and it was that. And when I was like, I was like going into junior high, and suddenly I can watch Jurassic World of Park 2 or whatever in my room. It was huge. So I understand the weight of that. Huge deal. But obviously, like the shittiest TV in the house. (laughs) Um, And we're all playing like sitting on the carpet. Like, just in the corner of this room, like, having the best fucking time. And also, when we're at my grandma's, we're probably staying there all weekend. We're eating, like, cake for breakfast and dinner. 
Like we're allowed <laughs> to have soda here, which yeah. we weren't like we're just all the rules of um, our house no longer apply. Hell so yeah. we're just playing Mario Party, eating cake for every meal. Like it's just like little kid heaven. And then occasionally Sam is having a meltdown that he's <laughs> lost and throwing the controller. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. There's there's something, too, about, like, you know, as a kid in your, like, you know, in, like, your primary family, having, like, a family member or someone to escape to where the rules are different. And you don't have to adhere to all of the norms that maybe you have at your house. My my parents were, like, were wonderful parents. They were supportive. But they were also really strict about a lot of little things, too, um, maybe in a similar way that yours could have been. And so... Whether, whether I was going to, like, my best friend's house or grandma was watching us, having stuff go out the window was such a fun time of freedom for us, at least. Yeah, I wonder if that's almost important for kids to, like, have moments where the rules, like, don't apply and you can just let loose. Like, we were all still, like, being good kids yeah. for the most part. But I think we, yeah, it was just our place where, like, I always think of my grandma's house as this place of, like, wild imagination where, like, anything could happen and you get cake and you're playing games and we're watching like adults swim until like the early hours of the morning (laughs) and sleeping on the couch. Like we just got to do all the things we didn't get to do at home. And my house was not strict at all. Like my parents gave us very, very few rules. Like I was raised in the country. And so it was just kind of like, and again, four kids. So my mom was like, as long as nobody's crying, great. But like <laughs> they would do the things of like, yeah, we can't have soda in the house. That's just sure. like not an option. So it I think like even though we had very few rules at our house, just grandma's house felt like again, like such a magical place that like existed outside of the world of Modesto. I mean, she had like a fruit tree garden, a rose garden, like Wow. Apple trees where we would just throw rotten apples at each other every fall and like (laughs) jump off of hay bales and just like nail each other. And she had a pool with a slide and a big bouncy diving board that's like against regulation now. Like she had like a pond and a she had three different ponds. And in one of them, you could catch frogs. In one of them, there were koi fish. And in the other one, it was like basically a man lake, lake where you could go fishing. Like, wow, it was the most magical place ever. And so Mario Party was just a small part of that bigger kind of like magical zone in Modesto, the top yes. 10 most miserable cities in the U.S. So, yeah. That's that's so wonderful to hear. Yeah, there's really something to like, you know, for just about any kid like you're kind of getting into, regardless of the restrictive circumstance or not, having an escape or just a place where things are just different to know because like I don't know maybe I'm probably pontificating too much here but thinking about the world in general and like I think it you're kind of you're helping me get to this place of realization where like yeah having just seeing that pl- things don't always have to be a certain way uh can I think be healthy just for like a kid's brain maybe of like knowing that yeah things work this way here but other places in the world they might not and I think I don't know, especially if you're a kid, maybe, in, you know, we grew up in the same town. Someone could have had a completely different experience and maybe been like, never thought that was possible for them. Not just like yeah. the fun did of you it, have but like, a sp- sorry, go ahead. Did, did you have a space like that? I would say like, it was kind of similar stuff of like going to like my best friend's house or like uh, when we would visit my grandparents who lived in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, kind of a similar thing. But mm-hmm. maybe not quite to the degree that you did, but I, yeah, just I've said it enough, I think. I, I've reiterated the point, but. I think best friend's house is like a common touchstone for a lot of people. I because so. again, like at least the rules are different. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually your best friend's parents are on their best behavior and your parents are seldom on their best behavior. So you're getting like the most fun version of your best friend's house, you know? Oh, yeah. Like. I'm, I mean, I always think my my best friend growing up, uh, Eddie, I bring up all the time on this show because it's so hard for me not to link so many of these like 
core childhood memories like the ones you're talking about to him. And yeah, when we would, I would go and stay there. I might stay for a weekend. Like there was always Moose Tracks ice cream. They had yes. s- different things that we didn't have. So like uh, Moose Tracks ice cream is not the first time I brought that up on this show either. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I've, I've uh, rambled a bit, but it's just awesome to have a place like that for kids, I think. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think so. Um, Spend d- my whole life chasing it. <laughs> yeah, for real. Just to find like pockets as an adult where that sort of you can get that sort of feeling uh, does. It feels so amazing. And it really brings me back at least. Yeah, I think that's like the whole draw of improv, you know, is like getting that back to a small extent. Yes. Ah, oh, gosh. Uh, now that's what we call, a, I guess, a callback or connection or just like getting us back. Uh, just completing the circle full um, circle yeah full circle that's what it is uh i've got a couple more questions for you rachel um the first of which is you've already given me so much context wise um do you have any other any specific memories uh that you haven't brought up about like a time you played this game that you specifically remember a moment from or if there's nothing coming to mind is there an element that you haven't brought up yet Oh my gosh, great question. I'm trying to think. Um, It feels lame to be like, we covered it all. I'm trying to think of like specific memories, but it's, it's challenging. Sometimes too, when you, because it's so slow. I notice too, like sometimes when people play a game, like it sounds like you all return to this many times, like they all kind of can flow together. Uh, as opposed to be like the mm-hmm. one time I played this game, this like Michael like broke his arm or whatever. So it that yeah, makes sense. It's like the it's like the culmination of all of them that's like forms the like strong memory kind of. Yeah. Um, well, I guess if you think of one, you can bring it up, but there's no pressure. I'll, I'll pivot to that other question, which is: Is there like a detail? Or an element that you haven't brought up today about Mario Party 2 that you'd like to? Um, that's a great one. Um, I mean, we already talked about like chance and risk to, to a certain extent. But I really, I did just like how that could turn the whole course of a game. And I think like, weirdly, it's like a relief to know, like I'm someone who's like a perfectionist. I like to do things right and... I guess when I was a kid, a thing my grandma told me all the time was like, I'd be like, that's not fair. And she's always like, life isn't fair. (laughs) And I like could never accept it. And I'm still to this day, very like justice and fairness driven, Um, like to to, in ways that don't always serve me. Um, (laughs) So I think for me, like having the possibility that Bowser could just take all your coins or you could just get unlucky and land on his space and, like, lose all your stars. Yes. I think that was almost, like, good conditioning for me and good yeah. to see other people doing it and learning how just to be like, well, sometimes, randomly, shit sucks. Um, so I'm really glad that was always an element of the game because, you know, Mario Party is life. And <sighs> that was an important lesson for me to low-key be conditioned to learn. <laughs> Yes, Mario Party is the type of thing that prepares children for the real world. We, we're hearing that first here. I think every kid should play it because there are so many lessons. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, that's good. Um, well, uh, Rachel, before I move on to some fun post-show segments that I have prepared for you and we wrap up today, mm-hmm. will you do me a favor and just sort of like put a bow on the place that Mario Party 2 holds for you? Oh my god. Okay. Um Yeah, I don't I don't know. I would st- I would still play it any day mm-hmm. and would be thrilled for anybody to ask me to play. And I think it's great because anybody can play it. Anybody can win. Um and yeah, for me like video games are best spent with other people. They're not a solitary thing for me and so I think just like I think it just like brings a lot of opportunities for connection, whether it's through despair that your stars were stolen by Bowser (laughs) or stolen by like a friend. 
somebody you thought were was a friend. They bring like the elation of doing a two on two game together and like having the fastest bob sled. Yes. <laughs> um, I think it's yeah, I think it's like when I think about it, I don't think of myself as really a huge video game person. And like my parents always like shit on video games. But I think that that's one in particular that like, yeah, like benefited my life in such a lovely part of my childhood. And I'll always be grateful to it for that. That's really cool. Yeah. Just like a it can act as like a conduit for, you know, a hang, which is like in connection, like you said, which is like genuinely the reason that I like doing this show is because I love connecting with people on their level of like something that's special to them because that's it's just the most fun. As I love video games for a million reasons, and that might be the top one if I had to if I had to rank them, and I might rank them on this episode. Um, well, oh my god! Yeah, so be ready for that. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for talking with us about Mario Party Two today. I'll lead us into our post show segments before we go. The first of which is the fact me by your game segment, and this is just where. I'm going to share a fun, f- a couple fun facts with you about Mario Party 2 today. How's that sound? I can't wait. Awesome. Uh, these come from two different sources today. The first of which comes from the, uh, the wonderful YouTube channel called Did You Know Gaming. They have uh, videos on all sorts of games uh, that like tell you fun facts that you didn't know before. Uh, and the first of which is just a l- localization change. Now, throughout... All sorts of video games, but especially the Mario Party series, there are always little tweaks that are made depending on where the game is being released, region-wise. So sometimes some content that is designed one way for the Japanese release will have some tweaks made to it for the, like, UK release or the US release. And one, um, there's one specific one I want to highlight, which I just, it's like, I don't need to try to decipher, but it's strange. Now... Uh, One fun thing that I don't think we brought up about Mario Party 2 is that at the end of every game, um, the way that the winner is revealed is that Bowser, in whatever scenario you're in, whether it's the Western or the pirate ship or space, Bowser's always, like, wreaking havoc somehow. Uh, And, like, there, it's always funny to me, this is a side note, but it's always funny to me, Rachel, how, like, Bowser's always, like, beating up a Koopa or someone, which is theoretically someone that's he's on being his a bully. team yeah 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 but he's being a bad boss so we gotta punish him and we need a hero to save the day we do oh, the reveal of these was always <sighs> so satisfying and again like such a sucker for a cut scene and yes. these were always like at the time like incredible because those didn't really exist so yes it was always so exciting waiting for the reveal of who won because they would give random stars at the end too for like whoever won the most games or landed on the most chance kind of like spaces so yes it was exciting and then it still felt like a surprise even if somebody was like leading most of the game yeah even if michael has like seven and the next person has two it's it still was fun and Maybe more fun when you were like, wait, who – that happened kind of quick. Who has the most stars? And then – like, maybe it could be me. It could yeah. be me. <laughs> Crossing my fingers. Um, one yeah. thing I like about that too, now that we're here, I'm just going to get into it, is that uh, mm-hmm. the reveal is so – it's cheesy in an endearing way where they're always like – the Bowser and the, <laughs> the person he's bullying will always turn towards camera and you'll see like a dark – outline like a sort of like the silhouette of a character it's always so generic and then they say like the who's that pokemon (laughs) of nintendo characters exactly like that and they say something along the lines of it's you and then i love the reveal of whoever it is of course is the most fun and it always lets out like a cheer of joy from whoever it is um and probably rage from someone else but i I love this. They engage in like a quick fight of some sort. Um, now I'm actually getting back to the to the uh, fact. Um, for example, in the pirate one, I believe you do like a little sword. He, they do a sword fight that you don't even control. Um, there's like a, the witch one. I think you you like zap Bowser. You make like you a, do a spell. You do a spell. Mm-hmm. The one that was noted in the Did You Know Gaming video is in the Western world where the player uh, and Bowser engage in like. Um, 
What do you call that, Rachel? Like a, it's not a shoot off, a, a quick draw. Is that what a that duel? Is? A duel. Yeah, quick draw. Yeah. And it's funny because they put they go in slow motion. They lift their pop guns at each other and they shoot, and you always get Bowser first, so you win. Um, but an interesting detail is that in the Japanese version, they they actually have like you know real revolvers, but in the U.S. release, it's like a little toy pop gun. Which that's funny. Which I find interesting just because in in all of the, like, I've, I've been talking about, like, localization and changes to, made to different versions of games. Usually the U.S. releases of things, like, violence is never the thing. This is a, the case in, like, movies and TV shows. The violence is mm-hmm. always, seems to be, like, the first thing or, like, the last thing to go. It's always, like, sex and, and other things that's taken out first. So to have the U.S. version not have, like, the real gun... I don't know. It's just, it's an interesting change that I wouldn't have guessed. Yeah, and it's also funny because Japanese, like, gun laws are so much more strict than U.S. gun laws. So, like, the fact that we're like, no, it can't be a real gun, even though any 18-year-old could buy one. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it is kind of contradictory, I guess, to, like, general societal attitudes around firearms. I think so. So that just, that struck me. Um, But that's... That's the first fact. The second one, I think, is going to be a little quicker. Uh, This I got from the Mario uh, Wiki, and it's titled Mario Party Firsts. Uh, We kind of discussed a little bit of this earlier, but Mario Party 2 established many series norms and was the game to usher in many first trends that would stick around for the series to come. Uh, This includes a few things, including the player's ability to hold an item. So buying items was new in this game. You can hold one at a time. In later games, I think they expand that. Uh, they also included a highest difficulty option for mini games, so you could set the mini game difficulty to a whole new <laughs> level of difficulty. Uh, and Dang. then, lastly, one that we've both heaped praise for is it's the first one to have board specific costumes for playable characters. Which who doesn't like that? I mean, I loved it. So Incredible. Good. Um, that'll do it for the fact and value your game segment. And I'll lead us into the final one before we go, the game recommendations. Now, Rachel, this segment is my one forced tie-in to the movie Call Me By Your Name, where I am going to treat Mario Party 2 as your passionate summer fling that you have in Italy. Um, mm-hmm. uh, like the movie, unfortunately, this fling is not going to work out. You're, you're not going to end up together. So in order to help you get over this heartbreak of losing Mario Party 2, I've got three recommendations that all have a little something in common. And so are you ready to maybe meet a few flings? I'm excited. You're like Mario Party 3, 4, and 5, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Really could have totally done that. Um, So I've got three, like I said. The first of which is if you love this format, you love the Mario Party format, you love the chaos, you love the boards, mini games, dice rolls, but you're sick of this guy, Mario, you're tired of him. Then I'll Mm -hmm. recommend a game called Sonic Shuffle, which was a game made in the year 2000 Mm. that's essentially Mario Party, but from the Sonic series. Do you you like Sonic the Hedgehog at all? I think he's fine. (laughs) This will be perfect for you then. You'll tolerate him. Um, But Uh this... This game we've we have discussed in the show um, um, a, a while back. Uh, it, it it seems to be a jankier, more complicated Mario Party, but it's out there. Um, if uh, you like, really, all you care about this game is you like the dice rolls and you love getting lost in a world. Then I'm going to recommend a totally different game to you, which is uh, a game that took off last year called Baldur's Gate Three. Are you? So you may be oh, heard of this. Everybody's recommending this to me because it's also very sexy. It's very sexy. Are you are you a D and D person ever? Have you played D and D? I've played I've played D and D. Yeah. Okay. And I'm a big fantasy gal. Okay. So there might be a few things that you uh, that you're interested in about this fling, uh, Baldur's Gate three. Um, if lastly, Rachel, you're partied out. You're tired. You don't want to deal with this crap Mm -hmm. anymore. You want to embrace your inner artist. I'll recommend a game to you called Mario Paint, which was uh, for the (laughs) Super Nintendo. Do you know Mario Paint? It sounds so familiar. I feel like, okay, here's a deep cut. Yes. The McDonald's on, um, oh shit, like Rosemore and 
what's it like the Is McDonald's the I was costless? in the Richland parking lot. Yes. Yeah. They had N64 games, I believe, and mm-hmm. they may have had Mario Paint. I know they had Pokemon Snap. Oh, my um, gosh. I don't know I, if you ever went there, but. I did. There was one summer. I didn't frequent that place before this time, but uh, the summer after my freshman year of college, I worked at that grocery store across the street, mm-hmm. and I would occasionally go there on my, like, lunch break, and I remember seeing the, like, systems in there. Um yeah. Now, Mario Paint is essentially was this like little artist suite that was released on the Super Nintendo where you could make your own comics. You could make uh, music with it. Uh, you could do all sorts of little things. But it's kind of like uh, a beloved, like f- strange oddity that was on the Super Nintendo. They they actually developed um, one for the Nintendo 64, which never was released in the United States. And I don't even know if it got a Japanese release, but it was supposed to be kind of like a another follow up an artist suite um anyway sounds i know like you'd be an artistic person of, so <laughs> sounds like this was the start of adobe <laughs> yeah i think adobe can probably thank mario for their for their Paid. creative suite yeah <laughs> and and their subscription yeah. model now um uh rachel uh, i'll go ahead and recap your recommendations today we have sonic shuffle baldur's gate 3 and mario paint that'll wrap up the recommendations and that'll bring us to the end of the show so um on our way out before we go and plug whatever we want thank you so much for taking the time to do this this was really fun this is always fun for me to get to hear from people that i either know well or am like acquaintances with and as someone that like i feel like i've like i get smatterings of rachel every year like a few moments this was a nice chance to get to know a part about you that i would have never had any idea so thanks for sharing Thank you for asking. You bet. Um, on your way out, uh, is there anything you'd like to plug anywhere that people who are listening uh, should find you on the internet? Uh, yeah, you can uh, check out my art at Vaness, V-A-N-N-E-S Expressions on Instagram. Um, and that's about it. I love it. Uh, hot recommendation, folks. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, page to follow. Truly it's, it's one of those things where when I see one, I've told you this before, but when I'm scrolling through Instagram and one a new one pops up, I'm like, oh, what are – it's and it's so, such a suite of stuff that you have. I keep saying the word sweet today. <laughs> um, whether it's like <laughs> your – you know, the comics of you and the little ghost or it be just like literally just new cartoons that you make. It's so good. Um, uh, and I, I still – this thankfully this wasn't the end of the world, but I I have recently th- I think because I was preparing for you to come on, I was reminded of the time this year where I almost I like sort of spoiled someone's birthday gift that you had made for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, Mia's since gotten her birthday gift, so yes. it's all good. God, it I was felt a like huge such success. an idiot when I was like, Ooh, "What did you think about this?" Uh, Oh, that was so funny. God. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. I think she probably knew it was coming. I, th- I think that's, that is how it played out is that she did know, but I still in the moment, I was like, oh my God, I just ruined this. But anyway. You're like, the one time I see Rachel all year, I ruined her birthday surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Huge. That's all we're going to remember. Um, well, mm-hmm. yeah. So I'll put a link in the show notes uh, to that profile so people can find you. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to close this out. With some plugs of my own, uh, and again, listener, everything that I've listed and that we, we've got for Rachel, we're going to have a link in the show notes, including the cover art, which is done by the artist Glenn J. You can find him on his Instagram at Glenn with two N's dot J A Y. The show is produced, edited, and the original music up top is by Jeremy Schmidt, who we've mentioned a few times on this episode. Uh, you can thank him for the work he puts into this show by checking out his podcast, Video Games, a comedy show. If you're listening to this episode the week that, that it debuts, which I guess is going to be uh, March. Uh, it's March. What the hell? July 24th is when this episode's coming out. <laughs> um, the most recent episode of Video Games, a comedy show is episode 300. And we did something crazy for this one. Uh, we haven't recorded it where I am in the world, but by the time the listener gets it, you'll hear it. Check out Video Games, a comedy show. It's an amazing podcast also on this network. You can find um, us, the podcast, Call Me By Your Game, all over social media. I'd love for you to give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Blue Sky, especially TikTok. If you're on TikTok, 
Give us a follow there. You're going to see some great highlights from this episode. Um, probably us talking about childhood wonder. Uh, who knows what it, what we'll find. Um, you can find me on social media too. Uh, I'll have links to all my stuff, including my Twitch channel, if you want to come watch me play video games. And lastly, is that if you like me and the conversations I have people uh, with people about video games, you've got to check out our Patreon. We're over at patreon.com slash super NPC radio, where we have a uh, bonus content that comes out Every week, we have bonus video game podcasts that release. Uh, Depending on the tier you're at, there are different bonuses. So if you want to check us out there and find something that's right for you, whether it's a tier that has our games club, which we're playing through the the, the game Hollow Knight for the first time now, uh, those release every Friday. I do a bonus episode every month, which uh, is going to be delayed a week for the first time ever. Um, But anyway, check us out on Patreon. Otherwise... That'll do it for this episode of Call Me By Your Game. We will see you on the next one. 